Hello and welcome to this video on making sewing more accessible. This video is part of CoCovid, that is a wonderful weekend of online costume content for us all to enjoy from the safety of our own homes during these unprecedented times. Only if you like me have a disability, not leaving home for long periods of time isn't so unprecedented. Over the years my work as a costume maker has been greatly impacted by my disability and I, much like the world at large is having to now, have had to adapt. So in this video I'm going to share with you some of the tricks and techniques that I use in my daily work to make sewing with a disability easier. These are split into two parts. Part one is all about the way I plan and approach my projects and part two is all about practical little tips to make sewing that little bit easier. So Part one, I would like to start by saying that of course, disabilities are as varied and individual as the people who live with them. And so not all these techniques may be applicable to you, which leads me onto my first point, which is find what works for you. There are countless adaptive tools, alternative methods, or good old fashioned hacks that claim to make sewing easier, but depending on how your disability affects you, they may actually make life more difficult. An excellent example of this is rotary cutters. Fellow sewists always ask me why I don't use a rotary cutter as they are so much easier than scissors. But rotary cutters require continuous downward pressure to work, which I have found to be incredibly tiring and painful if using for prolonged periods of time. Instead, I like to use spring-loaded angled scissors like this Fiskars pair. Because they are angled, I can rest the weight of them on the table and the spring-loaded action means less thumb strain as I don't have to lift them open after every cut. I can cut for much longer periods of time and with much less pain with a good pair of scissors than I can with a rotary cutter, but this might be different for you. Experiment and find what works for you. The next tip I have for you is to know your limits. Only you know your own body, and as hard as it sometimes is, you have to work with it. Sewing is hard work. Big costume projects can be exhausting, and deadlines can bring stress and anxiety that none of us really need in our lives. So approach a sewing project with painful honesty about what you can realistically achieve and make sure to accommodate that when planning a project. For example, I know that I cannot sit at a sewing machine for long periods of time, I cannot work for eight hours straight, and I cannot pull all-nighters, and a whole load of inexplicably random external factors can leave me incapacitated for a week. So when deciding on a project, I factor in that I will probably only be able to work on it for a maximum of three hours a day, and I give myself longer deadlines as a result. I also use the 730 technique, which I learnt from Brittany J. Jones, and I sew in 30 minute blocks and schedule a rest in between them. This spreads out the physical impact of sewing so that I can actually sew for longer. For example, I can only really sit at a sewing machine for an hour straight before I have to stop for the day but if I sew in 30 minute chunks and then rest, I can sew for a total of three hours over the course of the day before I run out of energy. You'll be amazed how much you can get done in half an hour, and I often find that I am more focused as a result of the limited time frame. Feeding into this idea of knowing your limits is also to set flexible goals. You may have heard Noelle from Costuming Drama talk about compassionate deadlines, and that is absolutely something you should embrace but I actually go one step further and have flexible goals and also flexible standards. I work on a system that I call good, better and best. This is kind of based on the ideas of good enough and finished is better than perfect, but with a subtle mindset shift that comes from my previous points of knowing your limits. The best way to explain this is to give you a practical example. So say I want to go to the Jane Austen festival in Bath and I need a Regency outfit. When I plan my project, I start with the good, not good enough, but good what is a level of work and finish that I am happy with, that I know I will be proud of, but I won't have to sacrifice my health to achieve. So in my Regency example for my outfit, I know I will need a shift, but I'm not really bothered about it being super historically accurate or hand sewn or anything. It's only a shift, no one will see it, so I'm not going to waste my effort and energy on it. So I'm going to use a bought paper pattern and just sew it up quickly by machine. What I would like to focus my energy on is making some Regency stays for the proper silhouette, but I'm not that bothered about them being completely hand sewn. What I do want to focus on is the fit. So I'm going to buy a paper pattern, make as many twirls as it takes and construct them with a machine. What I will do is practice some handworked eyelets because I want to get better at those and that's a good use of my time and energy. Now for the dress, what I want to focus on is drafting my own pattern because that's something I enjoy doing and think would be energy well spent. I'm really not bothered about hand sewing long side seams so I'm going to machine those but I will do all the finishing by hand. Hems, binding, etc. all that I'll do by hand. As for accessories, I've got some shoes that will be acceptable and I'll buy a reticule because I'm not interested in making one of those. As for my head, 
I've got a headscarf that would make a good Regency turban, so I'm just going to do that because I can't be bothered with a bonnet. So here we have a plan for a good, perfectly acceptable and perfectly achievable, for me, Regency outfit. And this is plan A. This is what I am going into this project working towards. Now, along the way, something might happen that throws me off course and I can no longer draft my own dress pattern or hand sew my eyelets. And that's a compromise that I'll just have to accept. At that point, the project will be downgraded from good to good enough. But that isn't my plan B. Plan B is the better option. That is, I unexpectedly have more energy for this project than I originally thought I would, and now I want to do a little more work. So for the Regency example, I might decide that, nope, still not bothered about that shift, but I'm really interested in these Regency stays, so I'm gonna do some research and add my own cording design. As for the dress, I think I'll keep it the same as plan A, and if I'm still feeling this extra energy when I finish the dress, I'm going to make myself a bonnet. But still, I'll just buy a reticule and make do with my shoes and hey, maybe I'll buy some stockings too. Now, if by some miracle I find that I have unlimited time and energy to dedicate to a project, I may even work towards plan C, the best option. This is, if the sky were the limit, what would this project look like? I'd draft my own shift using a historical method and of course sew it all by hand. My stays would be completely hand stitched with an etched wooden busk. The gown would be draped by me and completely hand sewn. I'd knit my own silk stockings, make my own bonnet, a reticule to match, buy some American Dutch's shoes, and hey, maybe I'll even hand sew my own Spencer as well. Let's go wild. This process helps to clarify the aspects of a project that I really want to focus on and prioritise those, making it more likely that I will achieve the goals I really care about, which leads to a really satisfying project. If I achieve more than I originally set out to in my good design, it gives me a boost and I feel really great about myself. Whereas if I had started with my best design, I would have felt really disappointed and frustrated when I inevitably didn't reach my goal. I like to plan out my better and best options because I often come back to old projects with renewed energy at a later date to work on those other elements. It's subtle, but what I've done here is reshape the planning process to be less about compromise and more about bonus extras. Instead of starting with an ambitious goal that I'm probably never going to be able to achieve and having to compromise down, I start with what I know I can achieve comfortably and work upwards. Something else that I find really helpful as someone with a variable activity level is to work on more than one project at once. This can sound really counterintuitive because it means that you've got more to think about and manage, but hear me out. There are some parts of a project that are more physical than others. Cutting out, for example, is incredibly difficult for me, as is fitting. So it can be really frustrating when you get to a point in a project where you need to do something, say a fitting, but you have to wait for a day when you're well enough to actually do it. You have all this inspiration and drive to work and yet you have to wait for days and weeks for your health to be up to it and it feels like so much wasted time. But just because you're not well enough to do a fitting doesn't mean you're so unwell you couldn't pin in some pleats or hand sew a hem or sit and draft a pattern. So this is where having a different project to work on can be really useful, especially if that project is at a different point in the process than the one that is currently on hold. Instead of feeling like you are wasting time by not working on that project, you have just redirected your reduced energy level to where it can still be put to good use and progress is still made just on a different project. And this isn't just applicable for physical energy. I actually learned this tip from fellow Foundations Revealed members with ADHD and it's really worked for me. So if you've got a strategy of your own, please share it in the comments. The more we share, the more we can help each other. So that's all for part one, but now let's move on to part two and all the practical little things I do to make sewing easier. I'm going to approach this list sort of chronologically from the start of a project to the end and beginning with cutting. Cutting for me is one of the most challenging parts of any project because it is best to do it standing up at a table. Now, if you're disabled, that's not always an option. I know a lot of people cut out on the floor, but that isn't really an option for a lot of disabled people either, and there really isn't a way around a lot of the challenges that come from cutting out. So sometimes the only thing to do is to ask for help. Ask a friend or carer who you trust with your fabric scissors for help. Yes, it can be frustrating and embarrassing to have to ask for help, but it shouldn't be. Sewing brings so much joy to so many people with disabilities and it is important that we as disabled people prioritise our own happiness because God knows nobody else will. So it's okay to ask for help with cutting out or anything else for that matter. If finding a sewing buddy really isn't an option, I have found some other ways of cutting that limit the amount of time I spend standing up. Namely, I take my time. 
sometimes days to cut out five pattern pieces. What I often do is I lay the fabric out and pin the pattern pieces on on the first day and then roll the whole length of fabric up and stir it out of the way until I'm well enough to start cutting. Then I cut the fabric into smaller chunks or cut roughly around the pattern pieces. I can then cut these more precisely while sitting down and can turn the pattern pieces around instead of having to reach and twist to cut them out. This produces more cabbage off cuts but it saves me a lot of pain so I kind of don't care. Next, pinning. An issue that I have is the fact I don't have a very strong grip and that can make pinning difficult, particularly through several layers of fabric. The solution for this issue is actually really simple. Use a thimble for pinning. It helps to push the pins through the fabric, saves the surface of your fingers, and it also makes removing pins a lot easier. This saves me a lot of joint pain and a surprising amount of energy. Now lots of people tell me, oh I can never get on with a thimble or oh I don't know how to use a thimble. And to them I say, get over yourself and learn to use a thimble. And using a thimble for pinning is actually a great way to practice using one, because you don't need to be as dexterous as you do when sewing. They come in different sizes for a perfect fit, and there are also so many different types of thimble. Metal thimbles, open-ended thimbles, silicone rubber thimbles, and of course, Bernadette Banner has a video teaching you how to make your own leather thimble. In fact, you know, whether you have a disability or not is irrelevant. If you want to get better at sewing, you have to learn to use a thimble. Also on the subject of pinning, the type of pins you use can also make a real difference. It goes without saying that they need to be sharp and suitable for the type of fabric you are using, but if your disability affects your ability to pick up or see tiny wee objects, you may want to consider glass-headed or flower-headed pins. It's a little thing, but it could save you a lot of energy if you no longer have to fumble after stray pins. My next tip is actually a productivity tip that I found to be very useful, and that is to batch your tasks. This means quite simply to group all the similar tasks together for greater efficiency. If we were to apply this to a bodice construction, that would mean rather than the usual pattern instructions that go something like this, pin darts, sew darts, press darts, pin shoulder seams, sew shoulder seams, press shoulder seams, pin side seams, sew side seams, press side seams, what I would do is pin everything I can before I even get my sewing machine out. Sometimes it is necessary to sew and press a seam before moving on to the next one, but I find that when making a dress, I can batch together all the darts, pinning, sewing, and pressing them, and then I can pin all the shoulder seams, all the side seams, the pockets into the skirt, and some of the skirt seams. I can then get out my sewing machine and stitch them in one sitting. Then I can take all these pieces to the ironing board and press them in one sitting. So instead of having to constantly move around between the ironing board and the sewing machine and the work table, I only have to move three or four times. This method is also great to combine with the sew in 30 technique. So my first 30 minutes is going to be spent pinning everything, then I rest, then my next 30 minutes will be at the sewing machine, then rest, then my final 30 minutes at the ironing board. This keeps things really efficient and saves so much energy. Speaking of saving energy, something else I have found incredibly useful is to organize your supplies. I can't tell you how many hours of my life I have spent going, why did I put that thing? I am a chaotic person and the second I put something down it is lost and I will have to spend the next half an hour looking for it. And <sighs> I hate this. Oh my god it's so annoying. Literally why am I like this? I waste so much energy just looking for things I literally had in my hand two seconds ago. And the only way that I have found to combat this supernatural ability to lose things is to literally tie them to myself. I'm not joking. This idea actually started when I worked as a dresser backstage in theatres. It's common amongst dressers to wear either a hairdressing belt or a waitressing apron or bum bag that holds all sorts of emergency supplies, you know, safety pins, torches, needles and threads in case there's a wardrobe malfunction halfway through a show. Now I ended up keeping most of my sewing kit in my dresser's belt because it made it so easy to find and I've since taken to wearing it as I sew and I've gotten into the habit of only putting things down in the dresser's belt so that if, if, when I eventually lose something, the first place I look is the dresser's belt and nine times out of ten it's in there somewhere. I've also known colleagues in costume shops I have worked in wear their little scissors on a length of elastic around their neck so that they are always on hand for snipping those little threads. Genius. And this is probably the thing that has made the single greatest difference to my sewing practice and it's simply not having to waste my precious time and energy looking for things. So find an organisation system that works for you, tie things to yourself if you have to, and save yourself a lot of effort. Now I've tried to keep this list free of recommendations for things you can buy because I don't want you to waste your money on things that might not work for you, 
but there are of course a lot of adaptive technologies you can buy and if you have any recommendations for things that you use regularly and are comfortable sharing how they have helped you, please let me know in the comments. But there is one thing that I own that has really changed my life as a costume maker and that is an adjustable height folding ironing board. And this is because I can sit down to iron. This has been a game changer for me. We all know that good sewing is at least 50% good pressing, but I can't stand up for long periods of time. So I usually dread pressing because it involves standing at the ironing board. I know it's going to be really painful for me and so I don't press things as thoroughly as I know I ought to to avoid pain flare-ups. But the simple fact that I can make my ironing board low enough to sit at means I can now take my time carefully pressing up long skirt hems or getting a crisp edge along facings and linings or getting beautifully even pleats. Being able to sit down to iron has changed pressing for me from the thing I hate most about sewing to one of my favourite parts. The other thing about an adjustable height ironing board is you may find it a more comfortable height to work at than a standard dining table or desk, in which case you can sit and work at the ironing board use it to pin things or for hand sewing or whatever it is you need to do. A lot of back issues are caused by too high tables or too low chairs. So get the ironing board at the correct height for the chair you use and use it as a work table. And I think this video is probably long enough by now. These are just a few of the techniques that work for me. They may not work for you or they may really help you. I wanted to make this video because I have found so much wonderful support from fellow disabled sewists online and I want to give back to this community that has helped me so much. I know I mentioned it earlier, but I will ask again, if you have any suggestions for making sewing more accessible, please share them in the comments of this video. Let's go on supporting each other and sharing information to help others so our community can continue to thrive. I also recommend that you check out the rest of the co-covid schedule. You can find all the information in the description. There's going to be a live panel about disability and costuming over on Snappy Dragon's YouTube channel tomorrow, which you should definitely tune in for. But the Costube community is covering so many topics from gender in costuming to historical knitting and history bounding, and Abby Cox is even making a video on how to use a thimble. So you really have no excuse. <laughs> Thanks for watching. See you next time.